The Haunted Airbnb When I planned my summer vacation, I wanted something unique. My friends always chose the typical hotel stays, but I wanted an experience. That's how I ended up booking a quaint Airbnb in the middle of nowhere. The listing had boasted about its rustic charm, privacy, and beautiful countryside views. Little did I know, the secluded farmhouse held dark secrets. As I drove up the long, winding road leading to the house, the sun began to set, casting eerie shadows through the thick forest surrounding the property. The house itself was old but charming, with creaky wooden floors and a large front porch. As a lover of antiques, I was enchanted by the place. However, I felt a strange unease but brushed it off as pre-vacation jitters. I was greeted by Mrs. Norris, the elderly caretaker. Her eyes, cloudy with age, seemed to bore into me as she handed over the keys. Enjoy your stay, she said, her voice rasping. But remember, the house has rules. No loud noises after dark, and never go into the basement. I laughed nervously, thinking it was just a scare tactic to keep guests from partying. I felt a chill but shrugged it off. The first night was peaceful. I made dinner in the cozy kitchen, explored the house's nooks and crannies, and settled in the living room with a bottle of wine. As I chatted with myself, the wind howled outside, making the windows rattle. It felt like the house was alive. The next day, I decided to explore the surrounding woods. The forest was dense, with paths that twisted and turned unpredictably. I walked for hours, losing myself in the beauty of nature. But as the sun began to set, I realized I was lost. Panic set in as darkness enveloped me. Every rustle, every crack of a twig seemed magnified. I finally found my way back, guided by the dim light of the house in the distance. Exhausted, I went to bed early. That night, I woke up to a strange noise. It was a soft, persistent tapping, like someone knocking on a door. I listened carefully. The tapping grew louder, echoing through the silent house. I got up, following the sound. It led me to the basement door. Remembering Mrs. Norris's warning, I hesitated. But curiosity won. I slowly opened the door, revealing steep, dark stairs. The air was cold and smelled of damp earth. I could barely see anything, so I used my phone flashlight to illuminate the way. The tapping continued, louder now, coming from the far corner of the basement. As I approached, the beam of my flashlight caught something that made my blood run cold. There, scratched into the wall, were words, Help me! The tapping stopped. I fled upstairs, slamming the door behind me. I didn't sleep that night. Determined to find out what was going on, I searched online for any history about the house. I discovered that it had once belonged to a family that mysteriously disappeared in the 1940s. The only clue left behind was a note found in the basement. They are coming. I couldn't shake the feeling that something was terribly wrong. I wanted to leave, but I convinced myself to stay just one more night. I had paid for the weekend, after all. That evening, as I prepared dinner, the lights flickered. Power outages were common in old houses, so I lit some candles. The flickering shadows on the walls made the house feel even more ominous. Suddenly, there was a loud crash from upstairs. I rushed to see what had happened. The guest bedroom door was wide open, and the mirror on the dresser had shattered. A cold draft swept through the room, sending shivers down my spine. I spotted something under the bed and pulled out an old, dusty diary. It belonged to the daughter of the family who had disappeared. Her last entry read, We can't leave. They won't let us. The spirits are angry. The next day, the atmosphere in the house was heavy with tension. I wanted to leave immediately but decided to figure out what was going on. I set up cameras around the house, hoping to capture any paranormal activity. That night, I reviewed the footage. First, everything seemed normal. But then I saw it. A shadowy figure moving through the halls, disappearing into the basement. My heart pounded, and I felt a cold sweat break out. Determined to confront whatever was haunting me, 
I armed myself with a flashlight and a sense of dread. I descended into the basement once more. The air was even colder this time, and the smell of damp earth was stronger. I walked towards the far corner where I had seen the writing. As I approached, the tapping started again, louder and more frantic. The words help me were still there, but now they seemed fresher, as if someone had just scratched them into the wall. I felt a presence behind me and spun around, but there was nothing there. Suddenly, the basement door slammed shut, plunging me into darkness. My flashlight flickered, and I felt something cold brush against my arm. I swung the flashlight wildly, trying to see what was there, but the beam was weak and unsteady. In the dim light, I saw a figure standing in the corner. It was a young girl, her face pale and eyes hollow. She pointed to the wall and whispered, Help me! I stumbled back, tripping over something on the floor. I hit the ground hard, and the flashlight went out. I could hear the girl moving closer, her footsteps soft and deliberate. I fumbled for the flashlight, finally finding it and turning it on. The girl was gone. In her place, there was a small, old-fashioned doll. I picked it up, feeling a sense of dread wash over me. I needed to get out of there. I ran up the stairs and out of the house, not stopping until I reached my car. I didn't even pack my things. I just drove away, not caring where I was going as long as it was far from that house. I never went back to that Airbnb. I left a frantic voicemail for Mrs. Norris, telling her everything that had happened. She never responded, and the listing disappeared from the site. Months later, I received a package in the mail. There was no return address, just my name written in a shaky hand. Inside was the old, dusty diary and the doll. The last entry in the diary was different now. It read, You can't leave. They won't let you. The spirits are angry. I threw the diary and the doll away, hoping to put the experience behind me. But every now and then, I hear a soft, persistent tapping, like someone knocking on a door, and I can't help but wonder if the spirits followed me home. Story 2. The Airbnb in the Woods It all started when I needed a break. Work had been overwhelming, and I craved some solitude. A colleague mentioned an Airbnb in the woods, a small, modern cabin surrounded by nature. Sounded perfect, so I booked it for a long weekend. The drive took longer than expected. The GPS led me down winding roads and through dense forests. By the time I arrived, the sun was setting. The cabin looked exactly like the pictures, sleek and modern, yet cozy. It had large windows that offered stunning views of the forest and a small deck with a hot tub. As I unpacked, I found a note from the owner, Mr. Grayson. It welcomed me and reminded me to enjoy the peace and quiet. He mentioned that the nearest town was miles away and there was no cell service, but the cabin had a landline for emergencies. The first evening was peaceful. I cooked dinner, read a book, and enjoyed the tranquility. The silence was a bit unnerving at first, but I quickly adapted. I went to bed early, eager to explore the woods the next day. The next morning, I set out to explore the area. The forest was dense and beautiful, with trails that led deeper into the woods. I spent hours hiking, taking photos and enjoying the fresh air. As the sun began to set, I headed back to the cabin. That night, as I relaxed in the hot tub, I heard a distant sound. It was faint but unmistakable, the sound of laughter. It seemed out of place in the otherwise silent woods. I listened intently, but the laughter faded away. I shrugged it off, convincing myself it was just my imagination. Back inside, I settled into bed. The cabin was completely dark except for the moonlight streaming through the windows. As I drifted off to sleep, I heard a creaking sound. It was soft at first but grew louder. It sounded like footsteps. My heart raced. I got up and checked the cabin, but found nothing. The doors were locked, and there was no sign of anyone. I chalked it up to the house settling and went back to bed. The next day, I decided to take it easy. I spent the morning reading on the deck and the afternoon napping. When I woke up, it was late afternoon. 
I felt a strange unease, like I was being watched. I shook off the feeling and went inside to make dinner. As I cooked, I glanced out the window and saw someone standing at the edge of the woods. It was a man, just standing there, staring at the cabin. My heart pounded in my chest. I stepped closer to the window trying to get a better look, but he disappeared into the trees. I called out, but there was no answer. I checked the landline, considering calling the owner, but decided against it. Maybe it was just a hiker passing through. Still, I couldn't shake the uneasy feeling. That night, I locked all the doors and windows and went to bed early. I had trouble sleeping, listening for any sound. Around midnight, I heard it again, the laughter. This time, it was closer, almost right outside the cabin. I got up and looked out the window but saw nothing. I decided to call Mr. Grayson. The phone rang several times before he picked up. His voice was calm and reassuring. He told me there were no other cabins nearby and no reason for anyone to be in the woods. He suggested I get some rest and assured me I was safe. The next day I felt exhausted. I decided to cut my trip short and leave in the morning. I spent the day packing and trying to relax, but the sense of unease lingered. In the afternoon I went for one last walk. As I followed a trail, I stumbled upon something strange. It was an old, dilapidated cabin, hidden among the trees. Curious, I approached it. The door creaked as I pushed it open. Inside, the air was musty and stale. The cabin looked abandoned, with old furniture covered in dust. As I explored, I found a journal on a table. The entries were dated from years ago and detailed the life of a man named Jacob who had lived there. The last entry sent chills down my spine. It read, the laughter won't stop. They come at night, whispering and laughing. I can't escape them. I left the cabin, my heart racing. As I hurried back to my own cabin, I couldn't shake the feeling that I was being watched. That night, I barely slept. Every sound, every creak, set my nerves on edge. I was packed and ready to leave at first light. As I loaded my car, I glanced back at the cabin. It felt like the woods were watching me, waiting for me to leave. I drove away, not looking back. As I reached the main road, my phone regained service. I received several messages and missed calls from friends, checking on me. I quickly called Mr. Grayson to let him know I had left early. He sounded surprised. But I didn't get any call from you last night, he said. The landline in the cabin hasn't been working for months. A cold chill ran down my spine. I didn't know who I had spoken to that night, but I was glad to be far away from that cabin. Weeks later, I still couldn't shake the experience. The laughter, the footsteps, the figure in the woods, they haunted my dreams. I researched the area and found old newspaper articles about a man named Jacob who had lived in the woods and disappeared mysteriously. I never went back to that Airbnb, and I avoid remote cabins now. The peace and solitude I had sought turned into a nightmare I'll never forget. Sometimes, when I'm alone and the house is quiet, I think I hear faint laughter, and I wonder if they followed me home. Story 3. The Mirror House. It was supposed to be the perfect getaway. After months of relentless work, I needed a break. My friend Clara suggested a charming Airbnb she discovered online. It's called The Mirror House, she said showing me the pictures. It was a modern architectural marvel, nestled in a secluded part of the countryside, with walls made entirely of reflective glass, promised both luxury and solitude. I arrived at the mirror house just before sunset. The house was stunning, with its glass walls reflecting the surrounding forest and the orange hues of the setting sun. It was isolated, exactly what I needed to recharge. As I walked in, I marveled at the interior. Sleek, modern furniture, state-of-the-art appliances, and an open-plan design that made the house feel even more expansive. There was a note from the owner, Mr. Larson, welcoming me. It mentioned that the mirrors outside were specially designed to reflect the beauty of nature and provided a unique experience during both day and night. 
He also left instructions on how to use the house's advanced features and emergency contact numbers. That evening, I settled in, enjoying a quiet dinner while watching the sun dip below the horizon. The reflections in the glass walls were mesmerizing, creating an almost surreal atmosphere. As night fell, I felt a sense of tranquility wash over me. I went to bed early, excited for the days ahead. The next morning, I woke up feeling refreshed. I decided to spend the day exploring the nearby trails. The forest was dense and beautiful, with paths that wound through towering trees and over small, babbling brooks. I spent hours hiking, taking in the fresh air and the sounds of nature. Returning to the house in the late afternoon, I noticed something strange. One of the mirrors had a faint smudge on it, almost like a handprint. I shrugged it off, thinking it must have been from a bird or an animal. I cleaned it and went about my evening. That night, as I relaxed in the living room, I noticed something odd in the reflection of one of the mirrors. It seemed like there was a shadow moving behind me. I turned around quickly, but there was nothing there. I laughed nervously, attributing it to my imagination. I went to bed, but sleep didn't come easily. I kept hearing faint whispers, like someone murmuring just outside the house. Every time I got up to check, I found nothing. The next day, I decided to stay close to the house. I spent the morning reading and the afternoon lounging by the small, private pool. The sun was warm and the water was cool, perfect for relaxation. As evening approached, I felt a growing sense of unease. The whispers from the night before lingered in my mind. I decided to call Clara to distract myself. She answered cheerfully, and we chatted for a while. I mentioned the strange occurrences, and she laughed, saying I was probably just spooked by being alone in such an isolated place. Feeling somewhat reassured, I made dinner and settled in to watch a movie. As I watched, I noticed something in the reflection of the TV screen. It was faint, but it looked like a figure standing outside the house. I paused the movie and turned around, but again, there was nothing there. My heart pounded as I checked the mirrors. In one of them I saw a face, pale and gaunt with hollow eyes, staring back at me. I screamed and spun around, but the room was empty. The face was gone. I called Mr. Larson, explaining what I had seen. He sounded concerned but assured me that no one else had access to the property. He suggested it might be a trick of the light or my imagination playing tricks on me. The next morning I felt exhausted. I hadn't slept well, plagued by nightmares of the face in the mirror. Determined to figure out what was happening, I decided to explore the house more thoroughly. In the basement I found an old storage room filled with boxes. Among them was an old journal. It belonged to the original owner of the house a man named Edward who had designed and built it himself. The entries started off mundane but grew increasingly erratic. Edward wrote about seeing people in the mirrors, shadowy figures that moved independently of his own reflection. He described how they whispered to him at night, growing more insistent and hostile. His final entries were barely legible, filled with frantic warnings. They are trapped in the glass. They want to be free and do not look too long. I felt a chill run down my spine. The face I had seen, the whispers, they matched Edward's descriptions perfectly. I hurried back upstairs, feeling like I was being watched. That evening, I avoided the mirrors as much as possible, but it was nearly impossible in a house made of glass. As night fell, the whispers returned, louder and more persistent. I tried to ignore them, but they grew into a cacophony of voices, pleading and angry. I decided I couldn't stay another night. I packed my things quickly, planning to leave at first light. But as I walked past the mirrors, I saw them, dozens of faces staring back at me, their expressions twisted in anger and desperation. I ran to the bedroom and locked the door, feeling trapped and terrified. The whispers turned into shouts, and the mirrors seemed to pulse with a sinister energy. I huddled in the corner, trying to block out the noise, until exhaustion finally overtook me. I woke up to silence. The sun was just rising, 
casting a soft light through the windows. I gathered my things, avoiding the mirrors as best I could. As I loaded my car, I felt eyes on me, but I refused to look back. I drove away, the mirror house growing smaller in my rearview mirror. My phone regained service and I called Clara, telling her everything. She listened, shocked and apologetic, but I assured her it wasn't her fault. I never returned to the mirror house, and I left a detailed review warning others about what I experienced. A few weeks later, I received an email from Mr. Larson, thanking me for my feedback. He mentioned that he was closing the Airbnb listing and would be investigating the history of the house more thoroughly. Months passed, and life returned to normal. But sometimes, when I catch my reflection in a window or a mirror, I see them, faint, shadowy figures watching me, waiting. The memory of the mirror house haunts me, a reminder of the strange and unsettling things that lurk just beyond our understanding.